Okay, according to my watch, it's one o'clock, so let's start. Welcome, everybody. And uh, instead of me talking here for one hour about some important and important uh, business case, uh, we have lined up 11 speakers here who will all talk about something they are passionate about. The subjects they will cover are pretty diverse. Some people have uh, technical subjects, some of them are more business oriented, and some of them are, might be even philosophical. My name is Roel de Meester, and in the coming 60 seconds, I will tell you a little bit more about my company. Uh, we'll explain the format of this presentation and finally give you a quick overview of who is going to talk about what. Uh, our company, Wunderkraut, has roughly 150 people working across nine countries and speaking 23 languages. That makes us pretty unique in a way. And we basically, we deliver online solutions in an agile way. We build websites that just work. Uh, about the Ignite's uh, introduction here, as you might have noticed, uh, my slides are on auto advance here, 50 seconds for each slide. We have 20 slides for each presentation, and a quick calculation gives you roughly 300 seconds, is five minutes for each presentation. When I'm done talking here, uh, Steve is going to be talking about risk. Thomas here will be talking about predicting the future. Yannick and Benedict uh, will tell something more about custom layouts. I think Anne will be shouting about herself. James uh, will talk about the balance between theory and practice. Magnus about managing expectations. Mike about install profiles. Bernd about Bert about his love for the community. Bernd about learning a new language. Roy talks about responsive design. And finally, Emma talks about giving hugs. Okay, thank you and enjoy the upcoming 55 minutes. Next up. Thanks very much, Rul. We have a great team of people here, and we're going to try and make it entertaining, fast-paced, a great way into lunch here at DrupalCon. Now, my name is Steve Parks. I'm the managing director of the London office uh, of Wonderkraut, where we're called Wonderroot, just to be a, a little bit different. Uh, we do the same across Europe and all our different offices. One of the things that we do a lot of in the UK is coaching for agile projects, working with large organizations. So today, I want to talk about one of the things we talk to clients about, a reasonable approach to risk, handling the unforeseen. Because has anyone ever had anything unforeseen happen on a project they've been on? Yeah, any surprises? Yeah, you know what? It happens. Uh, and no matter how much corporates try and make sure their projects are risk-free, something still goes wrong and the projects can go down like the Titanic. And so what happens? They respond to that, not in a healthy way, but in a way that actually causes more damage. They make rules. They set rules. We can't have another Titanic. Let's set a rule. No drowning. That will solve the problem. So the procurement department steps in. The legal department steps in. Contracts get thicker and heavier and more weighty. Rules get more petty and tiny. And these rules multiply across the organization. Everyone is trying to keep track of them all of the time and obey every single thing. And it means you can't stick to the contract anymore. And so what happens is then people get, get, get things done in the organization are the mavericks, the ones that are willing to just go beyond the rules a little bit. So the rules are then seen as meaningless because the only way to make the project happen is to bend the rules. But worse than that, what you also have is people that won't bend the rules. Corporate life is full of these. So you get people coming to a complete standstill when they you know, perceive there may be some kind of small rule that they could fall foul of and uh, it could be damaging to their career or their prospects. Then people take the rules even further, enforcing them in crazy ways that are damaging to the project. And this just causes massive amounts of damage. So they put in more rules, more rules all the time to try and prevent these things happening. In Wales, um, they have uh, the language Welsh, of course. Very few people speak it. The government insists all signs are in both languages. They email off a translation, uh, a request for translation. That request comes back with the translated text in Welsh. And this road sign says in Welsh, I'm out of the office at the moment, but will respond to your request for translation tomorrow. <laughs> So, and yet they have contracts full of rules and full of regulations to try and prevent things from going wrong. So all the time, warnings get more and more crazy. The rules, the regulations, they weigh things down all the time, and it causes massive damage. And the key is that something is missing. Something 
has gone from the way that projects are run. There's an emptiness. There's a vast emptiness of trust. Trust is what makes web projects work. And for trust, you have to have a number of things in place. You as an agency have to demonstrate responsibility. You have to show you have the right people for the job. <laughs> with the right level of training and expertise that they can execute it properly. You have to show that you have the right tools and professional practices for the job so that you're not doing crazy things like a hacking core or this. <laughs> you have to have that professional approach that clients respond to and build trust, and that's the only way to get things done. Then, of course, you have to have some element of planning. And too often people think that agile means no planning, when in fact it means responsible planning. These workmen were hired to put up bollards to stop people parking in this space. Can you see what they've done wrong with their lack of planning? <laughs> Someone here was watching them from their apartment trying to get out for hours after they'd done this until they had to dig that up. You also have to put users at the center of what you're doing rather than rules and regulations. Consider what the end users need, not just what the rules and regulations say. Because you can do all you want up front, as the contract says, but users will want something over here. And that's what's best for the client and the project. <laughs> Transparency. Transparency is key to you know, stopping bad behavior. Don't put rules in place. Just make sure that when think people are doing things wrong, when something's going wrong on the project, it's really, really easy to see. And live what you, what you believe. Show an example. You know, if you're believing in certain ways of working, do them all the time and be seen to do them all the time. And then have a healthy attitude to risk. That means there will not be no risk. You have to have a sensible attitude. Go in brave. Go in with the right equipment. And go and get that cheese, that project cheese. Because it is worth it. But you have to take a reasonable, responsible approach to risk. And not try and pretend there will be no risk ever. That's me. Feel free to follow me on Twitter, tweet me with questions or anything like that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Uh, entertaining as always. Uh, my name is Thomas. I, I represent the Stockholm office uh, of Wunderkart. I work with web strategy. And I will talk to you about a concept that we call impact mapping, or it's called impact ma mapping. And... and um, it's really something that we practiced for some time in Sweden now, and we really love it. And it's, it's a way to, to manage agile and uh, uh, project expectations, I would say. And, and uh, first of all, I'm, I'm really happy because we've been practicing agile for quite some time now, and it's creating great results for us, both as a company, but for our employees, and, and we're more efficient, and Agile is really, really, really cool. But Agile is not really enough when it comes to managing projects, um, especially if you look at Scrum as a process. It will help you to prioritize, but it won't really help you to tell which feature is it's better than the other. So what is impact mapping? Well, the easy answer is four words. and uh, it will give you a, a simple way um, to, to visualize your, your project and its goals. And it starts with why. It always starts with why. Why is the best tool we have uh, in our daily work? You always need to know why you need to do something to, to really be able to help someone. So don't forget to say why. The next one is who. And who, who helps with why? If you, don't, if you don't know that, it will be hard to tell what kind of features uh, or, or what you need to do in a project. Um, who uh, can be uh, a role or a system or, or a persona. Next thing is how. We want to know how who helps us with why. How can, can a person or a system produce the desired effect of a project? The next thing is what. We love what. We love to talk about what in a project. Features is, is what we are, are uh, passionate about. But this is the dangerous zone. This is where you can crash a project. So I will give you a, a small example of how you can do this in a project. Uh, it's an online magazine, and their business is driven by ads, basically. Uh, quite standard uh, way to do it for, for an online magazine. So, we start with why. Uh, they want to increase their incomes to 1 million euros per year, and they want to 
have a fixed deadline to this uh, in 2016. This is quite different from just saying increase traffic or release a new brand. Uh, and specifically when you look at it as this, you need to define a KPI for your project. What is it really you want to achieve and how do you measure that? So in this case, uh, we come, to come up with a KPI that is say, saying that, well, to generate this income, we need this amount of page views. So the next level is who? Who will help us reach this goal? Um, we have visitors, editors, advertisers, sales department. They all can produce something to help us reach this goal. So the next level is how. In this case, we just look at the visitors. Well, how can they produce more page views? Basically, registering on the site, sharing articles, staying longer on the site. We, we can assume that these activities will help us. The final level is what. Now we're the, into something that, that we, we normally discuss in projects. Maybe allow users to connect through Facebook or just a simplified uh, registration form. Uh, the result of this is maybe something that we're really used to see. A user story or an epic user story. And the thing is that if you start with this, it's really, really hard to see if you're really bringing any value to the project. So this is a simplified picture of, of how it might look in the end. Uh, it's really, you should keep this really simple. The less, uh, the better. Uh, and as you see here, uh, a good project uh, is not that complicated if you visualize it. And the, the, the awesome thing is that everyone will understand this. A visualized picture of your project and what you want to achieve. And you can do this in a few hours. Uh, if you want to read more on this topic, uh, I recommend you looking into these links. Uh, it's really awesome. Um, I, it changed my life in, in projects, basically, to do this. Uh, we, we even do this for our um, internal management, management right now. Thank you very much. Uh, next. Thanks a lot, Thomas. So, um, my name is Benedict, and this is Yannick. We are from the new Berlin office um, of Wundercrowd, and we want to tell you something about custom website layouts. So, what is this all about? Um, the layouts uh, we think of as, as some kind of product or page layouts which differ on every kind of page. So, you have, like, um, every product should display in a different way. You have different headers. Even a con content should be displayed in some kind of different way. So um, um, we came all the way to uh, Amsterdam to show you some kind of new way to building this. It's basically built on some stuff you already should know. So Yannick might want to show us uh, something about that. Yeah. Drupal 7 is almost four years old, and um, we think it's time for, for something new. And um, we want to show you new techniques to, to, do create, uh, to create fancy websites with a gorgeous act, uh, editor experience. And um, yeah. Today we are going to, to present you something, and um, we we have a solution for you, and um, we are using common contrib modules, which everybody of you may know, and um, we also created four small modules, which uh, which you can download on Drupal org, and um, yeah, our our solution is, uh, is, is is not a big thing. It's it's just uh, yeah, they are not big modules. It's based on standards, uh, you know, and um, there are no cross dependencies. And um, it's it's highly customizable, and it's it's also possible to implement new things. Um, surprise! Implement uh, cool things um, like like uh, you know. And um, yeah, thanks to our committers who who made this possible. <laughs> okay, so just just to make this a, bit, a little bit more graphical, so we have the Drupal core. Basically, we are using just nodes, entities, and fields. You all know about that. Um, combine those together with some display suit magic. Magic is a bit much, it's just some custom few modes. And um, together with, uh, with anti-reference, we can all combine the content. So in the end, you got all on the same page. Usually, usually you have a separated page for the design, one for the content, and maybe some more other pages. We are connecting it to one node, which is currently displaying the page. So you can see it like here. You have the node on, at, as the auto wrapper. It contains all the metadata, for example, at a product, the product price, the country where you can buy it, and so on. And the content itself is separated in sections, and the sections itself can um, contain contents. 
So, um, um, like I said, you can store all the meter <laughs> metadata in the in the nodes um, itself, and um, the good thing, also good thing, is it is just listed on the content page. So you don't have a lot of different entries on admin content. So you'd have just one. Um, next thing is you have sections, and Yannick will tell us about that. Yeah, um, the content is divided into sections, and you can put different type, uh, different kind of uh, content into these sections. So um, imagine you have a section, and in the section I can I can put an image and a text. And you can also create three texts, or one image and two texts, and yeah, it's, uh, everything is, is possible, and we have reusable, uh, re we can use them in, um, in multiple places, and um, yeah, uh, you have the Drupal power, so just create a new, just create a new content and a content type, and then you can you can add fields and you can create new new contents, and you can also um, put views into it or blocks, and yeah, for custom coding you can also create C tools content types, and everything is possible with this solution and without um, panels. Um, it's 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 core plus DS and. Okay, so like uh, Yannick just said, you need no custom content to achieve this. Uh, you can just use basic modules and some small helper modules we created, and it's just below 1,000 lines of code, and this is not much for Drupal modules, um, and all the modules together, not each one. And in the end, we have a win-win situation. We try to use the Drupal way to achieve this, so if you want to um, improve the idea we have, it's not the final thing. You can contribute to Drupal itself, create patches from modules already exist, and improve that way Drupal is working. So in Drupal, uh, Drupal for Drupal 8, we have the good thing. We use the basic stuff, so it's, we should be possible to port this. And yeah, um, might not be that special, but here you can see we have uh, some well, kind of... <laughs> you can test it. Yeah, you can sc scan it and test it. Uh, so we have a distribution for that, and uh, there's also default content in, in it. It's responsive, SEO optimized, and yeah, also a lot of other Drupal uh, Wonder Code best practices in it. Thank you a lot. Check out the buff later. Okay. Uh, and we have a buff to our slide here, so you're f uh, welcome to join. Okay. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Anne. I am um, CMO and partner for uh, Wundercrowd in the Benelux. We're based in Ghent, Antwerp and uh, Utrecht. I live in Ghent, which is a great city. You should come and visit whenever you can. I'm often on the road and what I like to do is I like to share ideas about how to make complex things simple. And preferably, I do that over a cup of coffee or a glass of wine. Where do we come from? Actually, we own a strategic marketing agency with a strong focus on two things, and that is taking into account end user needs and simplifying business propositions. Since a few months, we've been teaming up with Wundercrowd because we believe that a combination of strategic thinking with smart web building can generate a complementary offering into the market and that helps our customers grow. How do we do that? We always start from the business perspective because a website, even when it works from a technical point of view, that doesn't mean that it is a great website. A site is only great when you have a digital strategy, just like building a house. You don't build a house without an architect either. Either you need to have a plan and successful companies know that they need that type of plan. And that plan consists of three things. The first is successful companies understand that customers do not buy products, but that they want to fulfill a specific need. For example, people go to Starbucks not for the great coffee, but to have a meeting space. Secondly, um, successful businesses never copy others. They never copy others because they know that it is better to stay truthful and uh, to, to stay close to their own DNA because if you copy, you're only a shadow of the other one. And third, successful businesses create content. They create content and they think transactional, they make their content shareable and they create lots of call to actions. Did you know that today about over 50% of all business decisions are being taken online? And that is why we believe that websites should function like a mirror. 
What do we do? What do we, what do we mean by that? A website should work like a mirror. We mean that people should recognize themselves in the, contact, in the content you bring. You should connect with their experience and they should find exactly what they want. In other words, a, a site should never be too much about you. It must not reflect your company structure or say that you are the best. And if you do so, it may well be that that is the reason why you don't have too many visitors. Same is true for persons. Did you ever trust a person that says, I'm a great manager or I am a fantastic entertainer? No. Well, the same goes for great companies. Companies that are great never say so. They only prove it. And to prove that you have great content and that you have that you're a great company, you have to offer experiences and you have to earn your customers. You have to turn them into advocates and then they even become a channel and they tell everyone how great you are. And this is what I actually learned from having worked very long in the uh, airplane industry and that is planes are planes. It is the airline that makes the difference. The same is true for um, websites and for companies. Being recommended is the best you can get. And I think if Confucius would come back today, he might as well add a sentence to his famous quote. So this brings me to almost the end of my presentation. So content and consistency is really important. And actually, I would like to, I would like you to remember three things. And that is, most decisions are being prepared online, even in an offline business. People don't buy products, but they want to fulfill their own wants and needs. And third, a website only adds value when visitors recognize themselves in what you say. So I would like to thank you and I would also like to invite you to our uh, World Boot to further discuss this type of ideas or to come and discover our healthy web approach. And I'm now happy to give the floor to my colleague James from Estonia. Hi. I'm uh, James Nesbitt. It says uh, Estonia. I'm actually from Latvia, but uh, no, no, no. It, it says Estonia. What can you say? It's, but uh, I'll, maybe I'll come to Estonia too. So uh, I'm going to do a bit more of a, a developer-oriented presentation. Uh, as you'll see from my slides, I'm a back-end developer. Uh, but I thought I would try and uh, talk a bit more about our practices when it comes to being uh, a developer. And I'll do it a bit from a case study perspective uh, from something interesting that uh, happened to me on a project this year. Uh, wait, ah, so um, I finally did my first of uh, these uh, single page app applications this year. So uh, the, the one I did was Marinette, uh, but so I'm talking about Angular and this kind of stuff, uh, which I was really excited to do. I'd been waiting for this kind of thing. Uh, uh, and the experience was great. You know, it was conceptually what I wanted. I want to get away from this old concept of uh, we're serving documents. No, we're writing apps. And, uh, you know, these two pages, they look the same, but they're actually completely different and refreshed. And there's white space in between. All the things I didn't like, I got to get away from. Uh, so the problem was is uh, um, we had all these concepts that we wanted to do. And uh, when we got there, we realized uh, we have one, only one problem. Uh, we're actually uh, incredibly lazy. Uh, developers, and uh, that's kind of good. Uh, we had this complex interaction that now happens, uh, and we thought we understood it, uh, but all these really complex things were happening. Uh, what happens is that we had, uh, well, it's really fast, huh? So we had, um, we thought we knew what it would be, but things moved around really fast. And in particular, what happens is uh, things last a lot longer. And when they last a lot longer, we had these really interesting uh, problems that would arise. And we realized that what we've been doing is we've been uh, relying on this uh, refresh or uh, request as a reset. And it was uh, actually uh, pretty damaging for us. So. Uh, so the thing about being lazy is that it's good. We all know that developers are supposed to be lazy. We're supposed to minimize effort and minimize cost. Uh, but when we got into this kind of thing, we found that, uh, I feel like the slides are in the wrong order, but. Um, so here's an example of what would go wrong in a single page app. Uh, you have all these things that are connected that are in space at the same time, and uh, they move around. Uh, events uh, connect across aspects, and it gets really confusing. So I'll just 
I'll slow down and skip one, actually. OK, the thing is, is that uh, our developers outside of the web, they already know this stuff. Desktop developers, app developers, they don't have refresh and requests. Uh, and I was thinking, as a developer, I don't want to change my practices too much, but maybe I can look for tools that uh, other developers might have. I don't want to innovate, but uh, I do need some kind of solution that can come in. So, and of course, I don't mean just technologies, but approaches and concepts as well. So I was working on this app, and uh, uh, 24 actually was going wrong at the time and debugging, and I found this really interesting thing which you can't read. It says uh, state controller. Uh, I thought about that, I'm like, state? Uh, th I have no idea what that state controller is. And then it dawned on me, this complexity problem that I was having in my application was actually really a state problem uh, that reminded me of all of these... Uh, uh, computer science classes I had talking about state. In there, there was a state controller and a state models. The only purpose of this thing was to handle changes in state. And uh, I realized that we can switch to an approach of thinking about state, uh, this developer concept, program program uh, programmatic approach. Uh, and instead of having views, the triggering events that, uh, that happen in controllers, uh, change models, go back to views, we can tie everything into single, uh, single, single, uh, changes that happen only in these state controllers uh, and give us this great single place where everything can connect into. Instead of this view, this model, and this controller, changes that happen go directly into only these state controllers and models. You want to, for example, if you want to initialize a root, you ju just initialize the state. You respond and display state. If you need to reinitialize it, it's the same process that happens again. Uh, it was a small change for us. It didn't require massive change in thinking, which was great, uh, but it solved our complexity problem. And it helped us write apps that were actually smarter. Uh, they knew what they were, uh, they could self-heal, and they had a uh, really much easier approach to get into to the bug. So in, in an attempt to just stay as a developer and solve client problems and not completely revolutionize it, uh, what I did was I, I pulled in small amounts of tools and used small changes uh, to slightly change the way I work, but I tried to stay focused on being a developer. So. Oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Agnes, uh, Managing Director uh, at the Stockholm office of Wunderkraut, and I will switch topics again and uh, now into something that correlates to what Steve said earlier uh, about managing expectations and the important importance of using the steering group of your project as a tool for doing that. First of all, uh, I think everyone here has been in a failed web project because web projects fail. Um, they, fail they, they fail regardless of your, your project model, your process. I would say ag agile projects fail a little bit less than other projects, but some of you may disagree. Uh, project fails for a number of reasons. Uh, but what's interesting is they almost never fail for technical reasons. It's, it was too hard. That almost never happened. But the highest reason for failure is lack of communication in the project. And I want to address uh, a specific topic here, and that is my feeling is that when the project, project fails, is the reason is it didn't deliver what was expected by the client. Uh, so why didn't we deliver what was expected? Um, what the client expects is really simple. They expect the scope to be delivered on time and on budget. Could it be any simpler than that? Uh, it couldn't be harder anyway. Uh, well, I've been through this, um, but the problem is, as you all know, many small decisions are made through the project from day one to the last day of the project. Uh, but not everyone is normally involved in those uh, small decisions, and that's why we're using why we're, where are we using the steering group to do that, and with, we use it to talk about something called we call the expectations gap. Um, in the beginning of the project, we all have a, a picture where we're headed. Uh, we as an agency have uh, almost the same, hopefully, ideas on where we're going. The client have hopefully similar ideas, but then through the project, all these decisions are made and requirements are changing. And expectations are changing. Um, so we end up here, and especially the high, high up in the client side, their expectations are still 
where they were in the beginning of the project. So what we want to do, and, and we do in all our projects right now, we use the steering group to set expectations and to manage them through the project. Um, the first thing we do is have a workshop with the steering group and see that all the important persons are in the steering group and we meet regularly. In this workshop, we agree on the business objecti objectives of the project and then we talk about this. So we say, what do you expect? Uh, you can have the scope, you can have the, it on time, you can have it on budget, but you can't have them all at the same time. Uh, please prioritize. Uh, and then we do a simple, simple um, uh, thing. We draw this on a whiteboard, or, and then we give everyone in the steering group uh, a bunch of uh, post-it notes, and they need to just put these with their name on it somewhere on this triangle. And this is a really, really good way to really start talking about the priorities of the project. Uh, and you often end up with the um, editor guys, they're here, finance guys over here, and then you have some other. But this is really a good discussion, and we can come back to this every time we meet. And we often meet every second week in the steering group, because don't summon the steering group when you are in trouble. Summon them regularly. Uh, we used to say it's like every second week, make sure you have the decision makers there, and always inform them about your progress. And where you are in the project right now. Be transparent, use it to manage risk, as Steve said earlier. We use this way of, you, of uh, displaying it. Or every steering group meeting, we present this uh, and focus the steering group on making decisions to minimize the risks we have this, this, in this part of the project. But meetings with the steering group are expensive. A lot of people involved, a uh, lot of important people, uh, and me too, uh, often uh, come well prepared. We use a fixed agenda, a fixed presentation we use all the time. And we really feel that this way we can m make the expectations gap a lot smaller and minimizing the risk for a project failure due to missed expectations. Uh, and if you meet expectations, you don't fail projects, basically. Thank you. My slides coming up, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, solution facilitator, oh, maybe not, but I'm a developer and uh, working in Sweden um, uh, as uh, part of a support team. And now my notes went upside down. Uh, if you can't install the site, it's broken. I, I'm going to tell you this like 20 times now because uh, the, the subject here is like when you install Drupal, uh, from the first beginning, uh, you, ca you can do it, but you need to have the workflow working in the end of the project also. So you ho uh, the site should always be installable. It should always uh, you can load the project. You could, should could uh, install the the site, um, and yeah. So uh, to have this workflow, you need to use profiles. Uh, most of the projects I haven't seen uh, use it, so it, that's good. But um, uh, also with the profile, the, the, the project is version controlled, and that's really, really important. And uh, also, if we, we work with Eger in uh, Wundgaard Sweden to deploy our sites, so, and we need to have profiles to do that. Uh, and the workflow we have is like we install the site, develop, deploy. Uh, Sometimes we use the uh, database from production, but that's only sometimes. Uh, when we have this kind of workflow, we know what we are going to deploy. Uh, configuration should always be in code. Uh, I have a rant about this l last night, but yeah. <laughs> this is really, really important. To have an installed workflow on the site, it's easy to see what your configuration is uh, when it's not in code. Uh, don't activate business critical models manually on production. Uh, that's yeah, it should be like uh, really crucial to not do that because you need to b control that also. And don't deactivate modules either manually. You have, a, you have to put that in code. Uh, all new configuration can be done in features or, uh, and you can deploy it with update hooks or some, something else. But uh, if you use uh, the install profile, you have control of them. Uh, 
Also, uh, the best practice of doing a site, I think it's building a site and, and do it uh, from the beginning again. <laughs> but that's not possible. So uh, if you have code in your code base that you not use anymore, don't throw it away. Because uh, old code sucks. It's, it's, uh, if it doesn't, doesn't do anything good, it's just smelly and, yeah, it's, it's not good. Uh, yeah. So I uh, come back to this, but uh, if you have a profile and we, you can install it, it's better version control because you know what, what models you are using, you, you know what you have put out on production. Uh, if you have the dependencies in the code, you will know that uh, early on uh, in when you install it locally, when you develop stuff, when another developer added some dependency and uh, the site breaks. Uh, if you want to roll back, if something went wrong on production, it's much easier to do that if you have a, a version controlled uh, configuration. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's better now. Oh, sorry, my notes went. Uh, yeah, this is crazy, but we have some clients who don't want us to access their production database at all. We have some financial clients that don't allow us to do that. So if we used to work with their, their website, we need to install it without a bit of this. Uh, yeah, and it helps and it proves st stability. You don't get uh, surprises. You get surprised, but not so very often. So. <laughs> uh, less it works locally, more happy customers. Because if I can install a site uh, in any time in a project on, on my local p computer, it's, I, I'm, I'm guessing it's going to work for the client also to, when we, we deploy it, but we, but we have deployed the code that we should do. Uh, if you can't install a site from the beginning, you have a code problem. There's, not, there's nothing you need to solve that. You ha need to figure out what is wrong in your code. Uh, so if, uh, to have this, you have to have configuration in code. You need to solve the problem because, uh, before you, ga you give it to the customer. And uh, this workflow in installing a site uh, that should be done in every stage, it's really, really important. So, bye. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. So how do you like Amsterdam? Okay. You know, we've been here before. Amsterdam 2005 was a DrupalCon here as well. I organized it. It's a long time ago. It's a long time ago. My user ID is 188. I can't code. I, I'm sales, right? So uh, that makes me, um, yeah, that makes me probably the first end user of Drupal and, and probably f the first end user in the community. And that's what I want to talk about. Um, you know, we have a saying, come for the code and stay for the community. And it's wrong. Customers should come for the community, not for the code. Now, we look at ourselves, but we're, we're actually, as a community, we're a beast, right? We're not as open-minded as we think we are, and our shadow tells stories about us that we don't want to know. So, so uh, why, why should customers come for the community? Well, they don't come for headless Drupal. I mean, if you have your bullshit bingo card today, I don't know. If it all says headless Drupal, you would be, all, all hands would be in the air. They come for the love, the love we have and, and the passion we have for our tool, and that we, we come together and work for semi-free, so, so our community is, is really full with rich colors and genders and political and sexual preferences and all kinds of other stuff. And that's okay, that's what we are, and we should be proud of that. So, but we are also a bit scary, we're, we're Herbies watching Herbie. We, we are afraid of to watching ourselves, and, and, and we are afraid of ties. They will take over our, our system. What we said at, at his keynote, is in fact very important because um, it's, it's, it's not about mobile first. Mobile first is a new internet explorer only. I don't like that slogan. It's business first, it's user first, and maybe it's Drupal last, but still, if it's Drupal last, the customer makes his money using Drupal. From the money, it's built on the web, and it's built on Drupal. So you can't say Drupal last, that's okay, but still, it is Drupal, and he needs to know the tool, and he needs a party that's implementing the tool for him that understands, holy shit, I love you. This is the time that you, it's okay to hug someone next to you and say, holy shit, I love you. Do it. <laughs> you will be fine. <laughs> um, but that's what we are. So, and how do you bring that love of the, 
we feel for each other to the customer. Now, companies have learned to do that. Wundercrowd, for example, knows how to align with the community, right? So um, all we have to do is tell you and our customers how we can align with the community. Now, this guy is not falling. He's not holding a board, but he's not falling, really. So why should you do that? Um, I like buy-in versus lock-in. Proprietary systems have a lock-in. We have a buy-in. The customer comes for us. Um, if you turn around the Wounded Crowd logo, have people seen that? It is, in fact, a Drupalicon. So if this is the customer, the, 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 the person we're all afraid of, the tie, the suit, the commercial entity, how do we turn our love and let them in the community? Well, four solutions. First solution is um, use his knowledge or the knowledge you have from the project and bring it in the community. 2014, and we still don't have an editor in core. That's, that's strange because every customer asks for it, right? An HTML editor. That's weird. So the second way is bring his code and his time in the community. So you all make modules for your customer, donate them, ask him to donate them. And the third way is bring him towards the community. There are a lot of customers of Wundercrowd here present. And it sounds scary, customers not, but customers to your, your competitor. It sounds scary, but it's not, it's okay. And the fourth solution is even better. Use, use the customer's resources to bring the community to the customer. He's got, he's got if, you, if you organize camps, He's got, he's got a venue where you can go. So there are four easy ways of aligning your customer with the community. Now, this is the traditional view, right? We have the community, and we have the commercial ecosystem. And that's not a healthy point. And that's what Dries, is, I think, is wanted to say. It should not be one versus the other. We should really think community includes commercial entities. And I think we're up this point where this is a given fact, and we should embrace it. There's nothing wrong with making money, right? Okay. So these are our customers. You can see them walking around here. Um, <laughs> but, but but really, customers are just humans as well. So it's okay that that they are part of our community, and it's okay if they wear a tie or not. And I'll well drop the tie later. So my name is Bert Boerland. Uh, if you have enough time or too much time, follow me on Twitter at Bert Boerland. Um, and thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is Bant Andreas Drange, and I'm the Norwegian guy in the Finnish office. Uh, I moved to Finland two years ago. At that time, I knew a few Finnish words, which I cannot repeat here because that would be a major violation of the Drupal Code, <laughs> code of Conduct. And during those two years, I've been able to pick up enough Finnish to be able to have a more or less sensible conversation. And what I'm going to do now is show you how I've been studying Finnish because I've also learned how to learn a new language. So many people ask me if Finnish is difficult to learn, and I have to say it's kind of a uh, language from a different planet. <laughs> <laughs> and still it's possible. The first thing I did was ask a lot of friends about how you say this, how you do this, how you, why is this written like this? And nobody could really answer it because people just speak the language, right? Native speakers, they don't know. But when I registered for a course, I found out that teachers are great at explaining languages. They managed to structure things and information in a way that's actually possible to follow. They also gave us a lot of homework, like studying words for a chapter in the book. And I started using old-style flashcards, meaning that I wrote the Finnish word on one side and the Norwegian translation on the other side of this piece of paper, and I started memorizing them. And it's kind of nice until you have hundreds of words. Then a course mate told me about Anki, which is an app for the phone where I can do the same thing. And it uses a technique called spaced repetition, which actually is quite neat because it not only uh, lets me go away with all the pieces of paper, but it also spaces out how much I repeat the different words so it knows what I know and what I need to study more. And this technique can be used to study anything. You could also probably study all the Drupal hooks if you want to remember them by heart. And it's really great at optimizing learning. There is just one thing that this type of studying, it's not a panacea. You cannot study things that you don't already know. I'm on the wrong slide. And that's fine. So vocabulary is just one part of learning. And of course, if you memorize all the Drupal hooks, it's not going to help you and unless you know how to use them and what they're for. 
And then, next slide is that I also figured out that it's very good to study between Norwegian, my native language, and Finnish. Instead of downloading lists that other people had made of words that I wanted to study, I made my own because Norwegian is so much stronger wired into my brain. And also, when I make my own lists, I know the words are more important for me, so they're more relevant. And then there's the thing that you need to learn to speak as well. And it's kind of difficult because people tend to know how to speak English in Finland. And they're always very helpful, so they might, you know, switch to English to help you. But then I figured out there are some people out there who are actually quite helpful. Some people I met in parties, some girls that found me so cute that I was able to speak, you know, a little bit of Finnish. So they talked with me all night and they were adapting the vocabulary and the language they were using so I could actually follow. And during those kinds of conversations, I got to practice. And now I can even speak with more and more and more people. And step by step, I have become more fluent. And then you need to start reading. And it's very tempting to read text very careful. And you know, you underline all the words. Then you look them up in the dictionary. And it really takes a heavy effort. And I did it. And I put the words in Anki. So it's been helpful. But I also tried to just read stuff. I found some old 70s spy novels translated into Finnish. Very simple. And you know, just read and make sure that you get the idea, maybe not all the sentences. And then I've tried to listen to different news broadcasts. In Finland, there is a brilliant one, which is called Simple Ule News in Simple Finnish. They read slowly. It's great. Some tools I've been using, this is a web lexicon. It's based on the Wiktionary, which is Wikipedia's dictionary project. And it has also conjugations of words, which is very important when you're studying Finnish. And the other tool I've been using is glossby.com. It also has a dictionary. But the best thing here is it shows you the words in context. So they have loaded in EU legislation, which is translated into quite many languages, including Finnish and English. And movie subtitles, which tend to be translated. And they're great to see how the words are used. My first rule when I started studying Finnish was to never give up. And I realized after a while that actually the most important thing is to believe that you can. If you believe you can learn the language, then you will not just block out every time you read something difficult. So what I've been gaining from this is now I'm more independent in my workplace. I'm not still able to speak super fluently, but I can at least understand tickets, support tickets in Finnish. I don't need to ask my colleagues. And also I can survive more easily socially. And then I just want to thank also my employer that actually paid for all my language courses and my books and everything. And I want to thank you guys for listening. And just get in touch if you want to know more about stuff because, you know, five minutes, short time, I, I can tell more. Almost done. Um, so, yeah, my name is Roy. I work for uh, both uh, the Dutch and the uh, Belgian offices as a UX designer. And today I want to talk a bit about our approach to making existing larger, largest websites uh, available to uh, on smaller devices. You know, uh, responsive design is a thing, um, but you have a site out there. And it's not only that you have to consider the small screens that you have to f make things work on. And there's the other side of the spectrum as well. Uh, larger monitors, big TVs, uh, outside uh, public display systems, and who knows whatever futuristic new devices will come out uh, that we don't know uh, yet what they will do. Because it's not only about screen size, it's also about different capabilities that we have to consider when going responsive. Um, so you remember those mock-ups with an iMac and an iPad and an iPhone, and then that was responsive design. Um, turns out it's not that obvious, uh, and it really never was. But it does make sense to start with the smaller screens, because uh, you have to admit it, your website's too fat. And uh, that's not healthy, so we have to lose the fat. And um, that means you have to make decisions about what needs to go. And for that, whoa. <laughs> Too much. <laughs> um, uh, you need to prioritize your content. And, uh, and this means that you have to have a framework for how to prioritize your content. So one of the first things is um, know your customer. We've heard this uh, a couple of times now, but dig deep into who is coming to your site, what are they trying to do there, and what to what goal. So why are they doing that? Um, Yes, no way around that. You have to know your customer. Second part of it 
okay, find all the layouts in your um, in your site, in your current site. There's different kinds of page templates that are in use, and you found, want to take an inventory of those. And then for each of those, decide how to reflow, how to stack that content. You've inf uh, you've uh, you know what uh, the, uh, the customer is coming to do, so now you can prioritize because small screens need simpler layouts, first things first. Um, and along the way, you'll find some interesting challenges, light boxes, uh, too big forms, uh, tables, videos, maps that just won't let themselves fit into a small screen just like that. So you have to make another decision there. And there it's... Do we go for a quick fix, like maybe simply hiding it or removing it from the site altogether? Or is it so important uh, that we have to rework these tables to become responsive? Um, and for that, go back to your users. What uh, are they going to achieve so for making that decision? And you can support your argument with uh, uh, the analytics. If people don't use it, it's probably not that necessary, so we can cut it. So a quick recap. Uh, Know thy customer, and based on those priorities, uh, reflow your uh, layouts for smaller screens. Um, that also means that this is a process that not necessarily uh, should you focus yet on creating device-specific features. You want to establish uh, a baseline first. Um, and don't confuse it with a redesign. Um, this is don't redesign really design at this point. What you want to do is focus on designing the right content because you're uh, finding out about uh, uh, what works and what does not work. And that's what you uh, really want to achieve when you retrofit this exi existing site. Um, what you want to do instead of redesign is simplify the visual language. Uh, probably, there's probably over-designed pages there where you have to make uh, smaller tweaks uh, that simplify so you get a more consistent look and feel. And with that, you establish a more generic, a more a shared baseline for your content um, in a way that makes this stuff work across all devices. And then maybe start thinking about device specifics. Um, so in doing this, you've created, uh, you've learned a lot about what content works and what does not work. And the stuff that you want to now have fixed you want to create a process and a data model um, that you can use to, um, uh, that you can apply uh, when uh, creating new content. So it's a learning process. And from that, thank you. Thank you, Roy. Um, I'm so happy that there are still people here, so my colleagues did something right not to bore you. Um, I'm Emma Mackin and I work from our uh, Finnish office and our Helsinki office. And today I'm going to talk to you about something very different and unique that we use. We have different kind of bonus system where hugs, in fact, turn into money. And we are not just a bunch of dorks who hug each other. We do that as well, but we use virtual tool for that. So basically we wanted to have a business, uh, a bonus system that would... Uh, emphasize how important our people are to us, employees and managers alike. But traditional bonus systems, they simply don't work. They are basically unfair, targeted to a smaller group of people like sales or some, something like that. And then people start expecting to get money at a certain period of time, for example, around Christmas, so it can turn into negative. And we wanted to introduce a different kind of bonus system that is unique and positive in a form of the hug system. So basically this is more positive, it's fair, and employees and management uh, decide amongst themselves who they want to assign bonus and based on what reasons. So basically the hug system works that every single one of us has up to five hugs per week to assign to their colleagues or charity if they want uh, via online tool. And then those hugs that people get turn into money based on company revenue. And we pay these hugs out randomly so there are no false expectations and distribute the hug comments regularly so that uh, people actually know why they were hugged. And reasons for this and value for, for the hug system for the company is that we actually get very valuable feedback and peer reviews out of the employees. They 
get to decide themselves who to hug, who earn the money. And the employees themselves, they of course get the positive feedback, they get the comment, comments uh, distributed by our manager uh, himself, and extra income never hurts anyone. Uh, so basically we have been using this hug system since November 2013. It started out as an experiment and we really uh, very early on noticed that the true val value of the hug system are the comments themselves. Um, so basically, uh, when we distribute the hug comments to our employees, they get valuable feedback, and that's the, the actual positive thing. And of course, there's money in it as well. Uh, people really liked the hug system. It's been a really positive thing, and people talk about the hug system, and people seem to prefer virtual hugs over, over physical ones for some reason, because you get money out of that. But basically, because we have used the HUG system um, a long time now, we, we have very extensive data out of the, the HUG comments, and we did an analysis of that. And here you can see the distribute, uh, distribution of how and why people hugged. So 52% of all hugs given were given based on performance. So basically, people got rewarded by how well they did their job, how, how well they functioned in a team, and how other, others thought that they actually did their job well. And then 29% was given based on support and encouragement. People noticed that someone is stressed out with multiple projects, for example, they give money encouragement in a form of hug system. And then 14% of all hugs were given based on personal reasons, getting married, having a baby, new haircut, or an in inventive lunch idea, for example. So basically, whatever reason people wanted to give each other hugs, um, they can do so. There's no limitation. And this is the, the only thing that's left. So 5% of all hugs were given with no comment at all. And because the comments are really the, the core of the hug system, these types of comments should be kept minimum. And we are currently improving the hug system all the time. We are making the hug system responsive with mobile app. And uh, it gives, sends out reminders to people so that they can actually know when and why they have hugged. Uh, so basically what I want you to, to learn from this is that positive feedback is really the core. And us get money from giving positive feedback. So that basically never hurts. So thank you so much. This was my presentation, more internal one. Uh, you can find me on, on Twitter as well. And um, I'll, I'll finish now. Thank you. <laughs> OK, we're done here. Uh, everybody is still in the room, apparently. So that might mean something. Uh, all of us will be around in, uh, at the DrupalCon in the coming days, so if you see someone wearing a strange carrot, just approach them if you have any questions about all of these topics. And, uh, or you can come to the Wunder Crowd booth if you have any more comments. Are there any small questions at this point? We still have three minutes left. Any questions you want to handle now? Please state the name of the person you want to <laughs> ask the question to. No? Okay. Thank you all. Bye.